we as people will let you down. If you put your faith and hope for relationship and growth in your pastor or your worship leader or your Christian contemporary musician, they're all going to let you down. The only perfect person is Jesus, and his faith, the faith that we have in Jesus, that's all we have. That's an individual one-on-one experience that you can only have by working on it with Jesus. Praying and talking to Jesus, worshiping and praising Jesus. And that's what we want to do here this morning. As lead worshipers at Curvinsville Alliance, we want to encourage each of you to praise Jesus, to talk to Jesus, to ask Jesus to meet you here so that we can each grow in our walk with God. We as people, the people on this platform, will let you down because we are people. But Jesus is perfect. And it's all about our relationship with him. It's all about knowing him more. And that's something that we do as individuals. And Jesus cares so deeply about those one-on-one experiences that he wants to meet us here. He wants us to know him more. But that happens in our praise to him individually. That happens in our prayer time with him individually. It's not about this music. It's not about what happens up on this stage. It's not about the pastors we watch on TV or the songs we listen to in the car. It's about our true, authentic relationship with Jesus. And if we try to find that anywhere else but in Jesus, it's all going to fall. But the truth of the matter is, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are family all of us online, all of us in this church. And as family, God calls us to love one another, to forgive each other. In fact, Matthew 6, 14 says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Romans 12, 5 tells us, So we, though are many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. That's us. We're the body of Christ. We're in the family of God. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together as a family. It's great that we're here this morning. If you're willing and able, let's just pray and praise God and grow individually in our walk with him. If you're willing and able, let's stand together. Dear Heavenly Father, We thank you for your forgiveness, that no matter what we do, it doesn't separate us from you, that you saw us in our brokenness, and you made a way for us, you called us out of the darkness, out of shame, out of sin, to relationship with you, Lord. And God, we thank you that our individual relationship with you matters so much. And all we have to do is talk with you, is worship you, is come to you with our needs. You want to hear from us. You want to grow closer to us. You want us to grow closer to you. Help us to not try to find that growth in you, that relationship with you, and anything else but you. We know the world will let us down. We know other people will let us down. But Lord, we thank you that as we seek you, you're making us more and more like you every day. You're changing us from glory to glory. Help us to love you the way we're called to love and help us to love others the way you love them. Lord, that's our prayer today. That's our heart this morning. God, help us to forgive where we need to forgive. 
help us to encourage where we need to encourage. Help us to ask forgiveness where we need to ask forgiveness. And let us love with your love. Thank you, Jesus, that we are here together today as a family. Thank you for making us in your image and making a way for us to have relationship with you and walk out our faith in relationship with others. God, we want to worship you this morning. We want to bring honor and glory and praise to you, Lord, because you're so worthy of it. And we do love you, and we do praise you. And as this bigger body of believers this morning, we want to glorify your name in song. Help us to do that. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in his name. Thanks be to God who always causes us to win. Yeah. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in his name. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
Wow, that was great this morning. Hey, I want to share with you just some things going on at Kerbinsville Alliance Church, and there are a lot of things going on at Kerbinsville Alliance Church. Make sure you picked up one of those. If you're online, I apologize for the late start this morning. There's nobody to blame but me, so I apologize for that, but we're good going. And I uh, want to also say, if you're not getting the email prayer requests and you're part of the Kerbinsville Alliance Church family, let us know. We want to make sure you get this in the email in case you forget to pick it up at church. So let me just share with you some stuff going on here. Number one, Tim and Christy Smay are inviting you to celebrate the adoption of Miss Callie Marie Smay. Uh, that party's going to be at 2 o'clock today at their house. At, uh, should I tell the address right over the internet so everybody can come? Yeah, 238 <laughs> Town Road uh, in Grampian. And uh, you can tell Tim and Christy who are here this morning if you're planning to come. They'd like to know you're coming, but please come. They just want to say thank you, Kermansville Alliance, and all their friends and relatives for the prayer support and the encouragement they've given them over the past three years. I went to Westmoreland County Jail, or not jail, it wasn't at the jail, courthouse, <laughs> uh, West Co Westmoreland County Courthouse this past <coughs> week, and I was there when the judge said, that baby is adopted. So that's uh, probably the funnest thing that ever happens in a courthouse. So good, good times. Tim, do you need to add anything to that? Good deal. All right. A couple other things. Uh, we're planning to do a children's lesson during the worship service on Sundays. This fall, we would like to begin calling children ages th calling children up for a three to five minute lesson during the second service each week. If you're able and willing to present such a lesson, please sign up for the Sunday of your choice on the Children's Ministry Bulletin Board down the lobby on the right. Is that on the right as I go down the lobby or the left? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the sign-up sheet there, you can sign up and say, We're, we'll provide you with a lesson and everything else. Uh, it's very short. A lot of different people helping out will make this go really well. If you have any questions about it, you can speak to Jess Satchik or Carrie Warren or Laurel Shields. Any of them would be glad to talk to you about that. Um, the women's small group is going to begin. It's called Invisible. It actually begins this week. Going to be reading Chapter 1, discussing it on the Facebook group and in text. Uh, group members are invited to meet on Wednesday um, the in room 103 at 6.30 p.m. That is this Wednesday um, for a time of prayer and fellowship. Um, it's not too late to join. You can register on the church website and buy your book today. Church website is kermansvillealliance.org. Um, youth group will be meeting tonight, and that's at 5.30 for an hour. Uh, kids' time is going to begin on the 19th at 5.30. It's for ages 8 through 6th grade. And that they will follow the same schedule as the youth group. So if the youth group's meeting, the kids are meeting. If the youth group isn't meeting, the kids are not meeting. If you have any questions, you can talk to Christy Smay concerning that. And to coincide with that, I'm going to start a small group um, using Dane Ortland's Gentle and Lowly. I'm actually going to, we're going to provide books for you on that. You can read them in advance and then come in at 530 on the same nights that youth and the kids are meeting. The adults will be meeting as well be kind of an open discussion group to discuss the material there. It may take us 10 minutes to discuss a, the chapter that we read. It may take us 10 hours. We'll just do as long as we need to and uh, cover that material and just enjoy it together. Um, and anything else? That says to subscribe on the pastor's blog. Yeah. Yeah. Make, oh, I know what it says. I wrote that. Please make sure you are subscribed <laughs> to the pastor's blog. Go to Kermansville Alliance and look for the pastor's blog. Put your email address in there so that you're getting alerts when things are going on like this. And uh, that's how we'll tell you as well if we're not having something, if there's cancellation, that and the prayer line. Double up on the way you can hear from us so you don't show up here some Sunday evening and there's no one else here. And you begin to wonder if you missed the rapture. You don't want to feel that way, right? All right, great. Elders meeting this week at 630. Guys know about that. Nursery workers, uh, we need you to volunteer if you would, even if you volunteered in the past. Speak to Kristen McCracken. Her phone number's in there. Hey, nursery workers, uh, Kristen, do you want to talk about that for a minute? Right. Thank you, Kristen, so much for overseeing us. And I can't say to you loudly enough what Kristen just said. Just because you signed up, just because you always were, we don't know if you're ready to come back. You've got to tell us. So please tell Kristen that. Kristen, I have good news for all your nursery workers. That is uh, tomorrow night, uh, Seth Fink and myself are going to be running cable back there. So I actually have video and audio of the worship service. 
Uh, and yeah, the nursery workers are all really glad about that, right? Yeah, yeah. But I'll bet, I'll bet this is what you do. I'll bet you mute it. I'll bet you mute it. <laughs> And I don't blame you. I don't blame you. But listen, we and, and people have said, what are you putting that in there for? You can't watch that when there's kids there. Here's why we're putting it in. Listen to this. We are so thankful for you giving your time that we want to make that just as, as helpful and meaningful to you as it can be. And if the kids are quiet and you have the audio on, that can be a blessing to you. And if they're not quiet and you mute it, you, at least you know when it's coming to an end, right? <laughs> hey, Drew's up. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, right? So yeah, so that's coming. Um, the first of those televisions is going in tomorrow night. I want to tell you this too. Let me just talk to you about televisions, okay? Men, your television might be too small. Amen. There it is. There it is. Uh, here, here's the deal. When when I was when b- before we got the TV before yeah before we got our fir- first flat c- screen TV, I had a 19 inch TV and that was pretty big because it was a four by three, right? So I got my mom a 19-inch TV, but it was flat screen, and it's like, a, it's like an envelope that you send in the mail. You know how small those are, right? Did you get one of those? If you got one of those and it's sitting in your attic, we want it, okay? We want it to put on a wall in the church. We'll take 19-inch, 32, and 42, and 56, and 110, and 316. Now, if you don't have one, and, you know, I announced this this morning. I got two in the morning service. This was sitting in my basement, you know. Because a lot of us bought the wrong size TVs, just we weren't thinking. But then there's the other ones. I had a nice 32-inch TV, but man, when the price came down on that 60-inch, I went ahead and bought it. Yeah. And guys, right now, you have my permission to do that. Okay. Did you notice I didn't even look at Bob's wife? I didn't even look. <laughs> Not even looking in that direction, right? But no, seriously, if you have a TV laying around and it, it's got to be flat screen. I don't want your tube. It's got to work. I, I, I don't want your junk. I don't, it's not for me anyway. And, and number three, it has to have speakers in it. Um, be, I can't use a computer. We can't use a computer monitor because we need to hear. Okay? So if you got that laying around, you want to donate to church, put it in front of my office. That would be great. Okay? Is that clear as mud? Okay, good, good. Let me just share with you some things we're praying about, if I could. Um, be praying for Sharon. I, I, mi- I missed this request in the first service. Vernon Sharon. Sharon is still waiting to hear from her doctor, c- from her doctor concerning the test results. She had uh, part of her lung removed here a couple weeks ago. So continue to pray for her and for Vern, if you would. Um, pray also, if you would, for um, our military personnel. I often don't uh, talk about current events like, oh, pray about th- the hurricane that's coming or pray for the people in Haiti or pray for the Afghanistan incident. Because I assume you're watching the news and you know that. Uh, I'm already praying about that. But pray about those things. Uh, pray especially regarding the situation in Afghanistan. And uh, pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones, uh, the military families and other families as well in the midst of their loss. Uh, a couple other things to be praying about. <coughs> Do pray for Margaret McCulley. Her brother Butch uh, passed away this past week. Um, there's a video on uh, Kermansville Alliance uh, on my blog and on the YouTube channel and on the Facebook uh, as well. That's six minutes long, and it is worth watching. I I, I say at the beginning of the video, and I believe this is true, sadly, um, there's three kinds of pastors who do videos. There's the pastor that does a video every day, and he has great content. I don't know how he does that. Bernie Neffley is that guy. Every video he makes every day is great. I tried to do that. I I have videos I never put up because they're just not good. Then there's the second pastor, and he's the pastor who makes a video when he has something to say, and it's good. And that's kind of what I am. There's a third pastor. He makes videos every day, and none of them are any good. Whoa, did I just say that out loud? I didn't mean to do that, okay? But I really do. I feel I fall into that second category. So if you see a video from Pastor Steve, don't pass it by because I feel like it's good for you. If you missed a video about Margaret's brother this week, go back and watch it because it will do well for you. It will help you. Uh, very much. Okay? All right. Those are the announcements. Uh, I'm going to count on you to read the rest of the prayer requests. I'm going to ask the guys if they would come and we'll receive uh, the offering at this time. Gentlemen. Hey, I do want to remind guys, I forgot about this, men's link's coming up, and if you haven't uh, registered, you'll want to do that very quickly. So somebody said to me, who is Brandon Root? Who in the world is Brandon Root? I don't know this guy. He's our youth leader. Turn around, Brandon. 
That's Brandon. You can always identify him. He has um, a superhero shield on his, what is that? Captain America shield, yeah. And Brandon has served in the U.S. military and the Navy specifically in a submarine. And he is also a reservist, a uh, chaplain for the uh, uh, U.S. Army. And uh, he's doing a lot of our youth ministry with his wife, who I don't see this morning. Uh, but uh, we're thankful for them. Would you like to ask God to bless the offering, Brandon? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Lord God, we thank you for everything that you are. 
We thank you, God, that you are alive and active, that you are still moving, that you are moving on on behalf of humanity commonly, but God, you still move for your people too. That the intimacy that we have as you, as our heavenly father, God, is should be something distinct. Should be recognizable. But God, you watch over your creation. You want to redeem it. God, we lift up this morning the just collectively, I guess, God, the the issues on planet Earth. I don't know how else to say it. God, we think of this, what appears to be hurricane that's going to slam into the Gulf Coast. And just to echo Tim's prayer this morning, pray that, pray that the meteorologists have it wrong. Turn that thing back out in the ocean, God. God, we think of the, uh, the incidents of violence around the world. We think of the servicemen and women in Afghanistan. Think of the Afghani people. I think of the demonic stronghold of Islam. I think of the brainwashing of ISIS-K and the Taliban. God, you want to redeem those people too, not just Americans. So God, I pray this morning that a miracle would happen. That you who rose from the dead that we just sang about. And we enjoy that blessing of knowing you. God, we celebrate too what it is that you have planned for places around the world like Afghanistan and Pakistan and Haiti and North Africa and just Southeast Asia and just our own backyards. God, we trust you with that. God, we think of that song we just sang, the Praise you, whom all blessings flow. And God, we don't always see your moving as blessings, if we're honest. Oftentimes, we see blessings as good things, positive things. Callie, finding a forever family. Why, with the doctors able to clear cancer. God, may we have the faith to praise you when the blessings don't look so crystal clear, when we're still sick, when our bodies still hurt, when our spouse is still ailing. May we continue to praise you in that. God, we look forward to this message this morning. The unknowns of a school year, God. The unknowns of how we will interact with classmates and teachers and students. As parents navigate another school year with with the pandemic looming. Jesus, you know all these things. You know our fears. You know our anxieties. You know our excitements. God, we hand those over to you as we look into your word this morning. I pray that we would have an open mind and an open heart to what it is that you want to teach us. I pray this all in your most holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, worship team. Thanks, Rusty. I am just really appreciative of the worship team and all the work they put into things each Sunday morning. 
I also want to take a minute before we look into the message here that's coming up in just a second. I want to just take a minute. Uh, do you have Callie with you there, buddy? Yeah? Yeah? Why don't you just show off your, your newly adopted daughter? Would you do that, Tim? You know what? Hey, 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 Tim, bring your whole stinking family up right here. <laughs> bring them up right here in front of me, right here. Yeah. I, well, they're not, they're not stinking. <laughs> Yeah, come on up. Yeah. So you guys can stand like you're in a, in a Christmas play. Just stand right in front of me, okay? And look at that congregation. Good to see you, Coop. Yeah. So I, I'd love you to come and stand like up on the step because I'd like the people online to see you too. Can we do that? Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. This is my good friend, Tim Smay, and he's going to he's gonna introduce from oldest to youngest his entire family. Would you do that, Tim? Okay. Oldest is me. Chris, then Christy. Where's Leah? There she is. Leah's over here. Marissa's right there. Cooper's right here. And this is Callie. <laughs> okay, now listen. We went uh, over to their house and stood around their house and prayed uh, as a church family. Many of you participated in that. Many of you stayed home and prayed, right? Um, we don't want to be those people that go to God when we want something and forget to say thank you afterward. So if you would like to say thank you to God in prayer with me, would you stand and join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this family that your love is shed abroad in their heart. We are so thankful for Callie. We are so thankful that the judicial system finally came through. All we ask is your blessing on this family. Short, sweet, to the point. Bless each of them individually and all of them as a family. May their lives be marked by the presence of Christ, both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Is that okay, Tim? Yes. Yeah. Did you want to say anything? No. Okay. <laughs> Cool stuff, huh? Cool stuff. All right, hey, I would like to uh, encourage you to open your Bibles, if you would, to Daniel. We're going to be there in a short time. This is a back-to-school sermon, but listen, even if you're not going back to school, this is for you. Because it's really a, here's how to live your life kind of a sermon. And the principles that we're going to be discussing apply to everyone. And they apply to you even if you hate school. Let me ask this question of the adults, okay? How many of you, at one point or another in your life, say, said, I hate school? Let me see your hands. Yeah. yeah, the high school principal has his hand up the highest and is waving. It was probably his last year of being a principal. He said, I hate school, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. E even if you don't like school, it can be a really good place to be. Um, I'm guessing it's the place where you make your very best friends growing up. And even if you're saying, nope, my best friend wasn't in school, my best friend, you still made really good friends in school growing up because the social environment just facilitates that very well. And for some of you, those friendships have lasted a lifetime. And school's good, too, because, believe it or not, you learn at school, right? For example, if you take a look at the screen, if you can read that, thank a teacher, right? Yeah, you learn something at school, so it can be a good place. But we all know this, that school can be a dangerous place. It can be a dangerous place for a number of reasons. Most of the teachers I had were really good people, and they were good teachers as well. Many of the teachers I had were believers, and they followed Jesus, and I'm thankful for them. But then there's always that one or two, right? I can remember at the university, I had an ancient history professor. I took ancient Greek history. I thought that might be good. For some reason, the university thought an electrical engineering student needed to have that degree, right? I don't understand that to this day, but they're still doing it, right? But this man, this professor, he was brilliant, very well educated. And as he was talking about ancient history, he wasn't just talking about Greek. He was talking about Babylonian history, all that area of the, the world, ancient history. And, and along the way, if he happened to make a Bible connection and he saw it in your face, he was going to go after that. I can remember one time I said, wait, Nebuchadnezzar, are you talking about the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego guy? And he turned into something between an excited chihuahua 
and a ferocious pit bull. And all he wanted to do was simply undress everything I believed about the Bible and everyone else. He was that teacher. And so, yeah, <laughs> schools can be a dangerous place. They can be a dangerous place because of friends at school. Friends that may lead you to places that you don't want to be as a Christian. And such friends are, <laughs> they're really everywhere, but they're definitely at school. I want to talk to you today about four men. One of them is named Daniel, and the book is named after him. They're probably high school age individuals, maybe college age. They're individuals whose life shows us how to do well in a time like when we're going through the school year. So I ask you to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to have it on the YouVersion Bible app. That may be helpful to you to follow along that way. The book of Daniel is about, uh, has four young men in it who are very impressive. Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. If those names don't ring a bell, you can think of them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One time a woman came to me. She'd been coming to our church for a little while. She said, hey, somebody was telling me about these people that were, in, and, and there was something about a furnace and stuff like that. I can't remember their names. And of course, she's thinking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And she said, it was, it was something like Ramalama Ding Dong or something like that. Right? <laughs> Those are the guys, right? Those are the guys. Yeah. They're men who have been actually abducted by a foreign power. And they've been traveled. They've been taken about 900 miles across the desert. And they're going to go to school for three years. It's not a four-year degree. It's a three-year degree, probably because they don't have to take ancient history. And they're going to serve in a king's palace in Babylon. And Babylon was a rocking place. Babylon had everything. It had culture and art. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It had history and it had power. It had learning and scholarly things coming out of Babylon, but it was an evil place as well. It was a place of evil, of excess, and of sin. And there were lots of young men who were taken from the countries that Babylon conquered back to serve in this way. But so far as I know, only these four men have a book written about them. And we're going to talk about what made their lives different. What was it that made Daniel and his friends' lives stand out? And as I read the story, I was just kind of thinking, so what can I say about them that's really relevant for us? And the first thing I would say about them is Daniel and his friends were thinkers. And you may think, wasn't well, everybody a thinker? I don't know. <laughs> Get on Facebook and let me know, right? right? Or how about you? Have you ever said, what was I thinking? And you knew doggone well. The answer was, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't thinking at all. But Daniel and his friends appear to be people that didn't just let life happen to them and nod their head and say, huh, okay, that's cool. They evaluated things. They looked at ideas, the new ones and the old ones, and they weren't afraid to question the things that they were told, even the things they were told to do. And they knew that ideas have consequences, maybe good consequences, maybe bad. Take a look how they're introduced in Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read half a dozen verses here. It begins and says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put, into and put them into treasures of the house of his God. Then he ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring the king's service, bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Okay, so the next verse is going to talk about here's who these guys were. It says they were young men without any physical defect, handsome, so a lot like your pastor. What are you laughing about? I'm just keeping you awake. Here we go. They were young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them the daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, and here they are, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So these guys were thinkers. 
These guys were people that when their, you know, maybe their Google News feed with today's headlines came by, they knew what was clickbait and they knew what wasn't, you know. They, they processed ideas in their mind. They, they developed what appears to have been a long-standing pattern of thinking before acting, of, of really looking to what was going on before making the decision. The students like Daniel, they need to be critical thinkers because Daniel and his three friends were going to a place where godliness was in short supply. And they were going to need to short, they were going to need to sort the laundry mentally. They were thinkers. And because they were thinkers, they were learners. People who were willing to learn. It says in verse 4, young man without any physical defect, handsome, showing an aptitude for every kind of learning. I want to take a little time this morning in my message and just talk to you about how my perspective on learning has changed. Um, I didn't used to consider myself a learner. I just wasn't interested in learning a lot of things that was there. In fact, I didn't consider myself a producer. I would think of myself, though I never would have used these words, as a consumer. You know the difference between a creator and a consumer, a producer and a consumer? Here's what I'm talking about. Television, video games, music, on albums, on cassettes, on CDs eventually, stories, anything that would entertain me, that is what I would pursue. And so my young life was dedicated to consuming those kinds of things, entertainment. There's nothing wrong with those. I still play video games today. But they don't bring out the best in anyone. And they didn't bring out the best in me. We're all consumers to one degree or another. And some of us are creators to one degree or another. And a part of the difference there is our willingness to be a learner. Somewhere along the corner, I, yeah, somewhere along the way, I turned a corner and I became what I'd heard someone talk about. I think it might have been my buddy Jeff. Jeff had his PhD. Jeff said, I'm done paying for education. Well, I hope so. <laughs> and then he said, but I am a lifelong learner. And he is. And I thought, a lifelong learner. Maybe I want to be a lifelong learner. And I kind of began to nurture in myself what I see in Daniel and his friends, an aptitude for learning. So we're looking at these men, what makes them different? And I see, well, they're thinkers and they're learners. And a third thing that makes them different is they're motivated. And that is a word that a lot of people hate. I'm just not motivated. Yeah, okay. Could you do this? Yeah, I'm just having trouble finding motivation for that. You know, you've got to have that done by, yeah, I don't have any motivation for that. I think a lot of us struggle with that. Let me clue you in to my motivation. I do not find motivation in other people pushing me along, you know? Before she died, if I happen to be talking to my mother on a Sunday night, sorry, on a Saturday night, you know what questions she would ask me. It's Saturday night, she's talking to her son, who is a preacher, what did mom ask him? Is your sermon done? Yeah, <laughs> every week. Is your sermon done? Yeah. That really didn't motivate me personally to have someone else pushing me. I'm sad to say I wasn't motivated by grades. I wasn't impressed if I got an A or if I got a C, and that kind of was something I might have paid closer attention to in terms of scholarships. But I wasn't motivated by grades. And honestly, my motivation doesn't come toward money, that kind of reward. I like money. <laughs> I like what it can get for me. But I don't think that motivates me like one would think it would. I think what has motivated me is what I imagine motivated Daniel and what I want you to consider as what can motivate you. And that is the question of identity. The question of identity. See, I think that Daniel and his friends were motivated because of who they thought they were. And you get a hint of this when you read in verse 8 of Daniel 1. 
where it says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. You get it? He's like a first-class slave. He's here to learn, and they're giving him food from the king's table, and he says, I don't want to defile myself with that. Why? Because I am a person whom I am devoted to God. It's who I am. I'm devoted to God. Motivation. It is tied to your understanding of your identity. Who are you? Who are you? What does that mean that you are that person? I want to suggest that when you know who you are, you tend to behave accordingly. And for me, and by the way, this isn't the Steve show. This is just kind of my heart's testimony along these lines. For me, my identity moved me to learn to become a lifelong learner because I identify as a follower of Christ who wants to help others become followers of Christ. My life verse is 2 Corinthians 5.20, which says, I beseech you be reconciled to God. I am Christ's ambassador. This is my identity. This is who I am. And if I'm going to live out that kind of identity as a Christ follower, on a deep level or not, I'm going to have to learn. If I'm going to help people find what I have found in Jesus, it has motivated me to want to learn history. I hated history. Do you know what I got in the ancient Greek history class? An F. An F. I paid money for that class. I got an F. But you know what I did just a couple years ago? Heard about a book when I was listening to NPR called The Silk Road. It's a history of the road between China and the West. It's written by a Harvard professor who is the smartest in his field in that. I got it and read it. Why? Because I want to learn so I can have an intelligent conversation with people. I become motivated to learn about vocabulary and how vocabulary changes. I've changed my vocabulary from saying man... (laughs) To, I started saying mankind, and I finally have landed on humankind. Do you know why? Because I want to be inclusive. I'm not afraid of feminism. I embrace being able to talk to people without giving them any reason to hold their hand up and say, I don't want to hear what you have to say because you're one of them. So I want to be educated. I become motivated to learn so that I can relate to stories and understand cultures. I went back and I read every book I can remember that an English teacher had given me to read in all my junior high and senior high. Do you know how many I read of those when I was in high school? Zero. Zero. I read Tom Sawyer in the past five or ten years. I read The Stranger by Camus. Wow, I should have been paying attention on that. That's garbage. You know? Right? Atlas Shrugged. (laughs) I read, and I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying, here, I'm just a dummy, and I can do this. I read The Brothers Karamazov. I read it in audiobook, and I read a lot of my books in audiobook. Brothers Karamazov, you know, that's a 38-hour audiobook. I got about 18 hours into it and I realized I don't know any of these people. I can't figure out who's who because they have all these Russian names and then they have the shortcuts for them. So, you know, like I know, you and I know that there's Timothy, who is Tim, who is also Timmy, who also might be Timmers, right? But if you're Russian and you have all those different things, you're like, is Timmers the same guy as Timothy? And why don't you just call him one name? I got 18 hours into it and said, I'm going to have to start over. And then I got the cheat books, you know, Shroop or whatever that is, you know, the, the, and, and I went through and I got all the characters. I wrote them into my app so I could get them. Why? Because I want to learn. Because I have a passion as a fully fully devoted follower of Christ to help others find what I have found in him. My motivation to learn comes exclusively from my identity as a Christ follower. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. In his book, Think, John Piper was writing, and he said this. He said, the well-educated person is a person who has 
habits of mind and heart to go on learning what he needs to learn to live in a Christ-exalting way for the rest of his life. And that would apply to whatever sphere of life he pursues. So whether you're a pastor or not, learn. If you're a believer, let your faith motivate you to learn, motivate you to do well, motivate you to make the most out of life. Turn, if you would, to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 48 in a minute. Uh, Daniel kind of answers the question in his story of how do I live in a difficult environment? Because he lived as a slave, albeit a first-class slave, in a pretty difficult world. So Daniel chapter 2, starting at verse 48, we see a snapshot of his life. It says, Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him, made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon, and placed him in charge of all his wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, administrators over the province of Babylon, while he himself remained in the royal court. Okay, he's thriving in a difficult environment. How is he doing that? And I think, I think you can pull from his stories some pointers that would help you to thrive when you're in a difficult environment. The first one would be this. Just know that God will help you. God will help you. Daniel's story says, God can help you even when others are being unreasonable. Back at the beginning of chapter 2, you're in chapter 2 already in verse 48, 49. Go back to verse 1. It says, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled. He could not sleep. So he summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the astrologers to tell them, to tell him rather, what he had dreamed. And when they came in, they stood before the king. Let me, let me just tell you the story so we don't have to read it. They come in and he says, I had a dream, I need the interpretation. And they said, sure, king, tell us what your dream is. What, you're going to give me a supernatural interpretation, right? Yeah, we can tell these things because the gods let us know. Great. Have your gods tell you what I dreamed. Huh? Yeah, that. I mean, if you can interpret them, surely you can know what they are. So tell me what I dreamed and then tell me the interpretation, by the way. If you don't come through on this, I'm going to kill you all. Wow. <laughs> I don't care what teacher gives you what homework do on what day. That, that doesn't compare to the unreasonableness of Nebuchadnezzar's demand. But take a look here. Look down at verse 17. It says, Daniel returned to his house and explain, explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision and Daniel praised the God of heaven. Wow. Wow. They prayed and God answered the prayer. They prayed and God helped them meet an expectation that was completely unreasonable. How do you live in a difficult environment? Believe that God can help you. Even when the demands are unreasonable and even when you're in danger. <laughs> Go to chapter 6, verse 21. We're going to read there another story here. By the way, during this past week, did you uh, see the headline in the, in the news about the German model who was attacked by a leopard? She had gone to a photo shoot and they had her in with a leopard and the leopard turned on her, and she was taken to the hospital. It was not a pretty outcome there. And, you know, we hear that, and we're like, who's surprised by that? Because we all know big cats are not to be toyed with. Well, in chapter 6 of Daniel, he is put in to a den of big cats, of lions. And he is fresh meat. They didn't eat him. He spent the whole night in there with a pride of lions, and they didn't touch him. In the morning, the king, who regrets having to put him in there, called out to see if Daniel had been eaten. And look at verse 21, what it says. Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done anything wrong before you, your majesty. And then the chapter ends in verse 28 with these words. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. You can do well, even in a dangerous situation. I can tell you an example of this. Um, 
when I was uh, in college, I was working a summer job, and um, there was a bully in the factory there. And I know what a bully is because I've been bullied and I've been a bully. I've seen it from both ends. It's just an ugly thing. And there's something about being tall and having red hair and being kind of loud and a little hyperactive. You become a magnet to bullies. And I was a magnet to bullies uh, from my childhood. And here I am, I'm a college student, and this guy, he, he's like, he punches me and he's doing all kinds of rude things to me. And it's making it miserable to go to work. And, and so I just prayed. And I didn't like spend hours in prayer concerning this. I said, God, you got to get that guy out of my life. That day, he was walking out of the factory, and another guy was walking toward him, and he punched him. He didn't know that guy had just had surgery, and he opened the stitches. And the next morning, the state police were there. Yeah, because that's an assault, and he was fired from his job. I, I don't know. I wish God answered all my prayers that quickly and efficiently, right? <laughs> I don't know if God did that because of that. I don't, I don't know the details. I don't pretend to know, but I know this. I know that you can believe that God will help you even when you're in danger. And you can believe that God will help you even when you're persecuted. I know that because I know Christians who have been persecuted and, and they're given like the worst job. There, there's a retired Pennsylvania State Police officer who comes to this church who never drank. He just never drank. And he had a, a commander who said, I will never give you anything but the crap jobs because I don't trust you because you don't drink. I don't even understand that sentence, right? And he lived his career that way. In our day, maybe persecution comes a little more everyday form of just being stereotyped and being caricatured. Oh, you're a Christian. You believe that. <laughs> wow, what kind of idiot are you, right? Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were persecuted on the plain of Dura. <laughs> the king had put up this huge statue and he arranged this orchestra to be there. By the way, it had bagpipes in it, so the Scotsmen are glad about that, right? He had this orchestra there, and, and, and whenever the music played, everyone needed to bow down on their face before this great idol that he had put there, this great statue on a plain door. And since they were leaders, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had to be there. And they weren't going to bow down. And they didn't. And if you don't bow down, the story tells you this more than once, you're going to go into that furnace that's blazing with fire, and you will die. We're not bound down anyway. And God was there with them. In fact, <laughs> God walked with them in that furnace. And uh, I'd encourage you to read Daniel 3 to just get the story. I'm going to spoil it for you, though. In verse 30, it says, The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And that's the way that story ends. You can do well, even when you're persecuted for doing the right thing. How'd they do this? First, they believed God could help them. Second, they walked closely to God. Prayer is a big issue for Daniel. Bible reading, it's the way we walk close to God. Daniel spent time with God. And by the way, that's why he was placed into the lion's den. The other officials, the people who were not from Israel, they were really jealous of him because the king, God granted him a lot of success in the eyes of the king. And, and so they said, let's see if we can get rid of him. How are we going to get rid of him? We've got to find a fault in him. And we can't find a fault in him. I know. So they went to the king and they said, hey, king, why don't you make this rule that anyone who prays to anybody except for you for the next 30 days gets thrown, gets thrown into the lion's den. And, you know, Daniel's like, I'm not going to quit praying. The king made the edict and uh, he still chose to pray. And that's how he got into the lion's den to begin with. He walked closely with God. Let me just say this. Your walk with God is important in all of your life. If you're a student, your walk with God is important in your education. And the most important book you will read this semester is your Bible. And I get it. <laughs> Students are busy because you have all those crazy Nebuchadnezzars with the unreasonable demands, right? <laughs> yeah. And you might be tempted to set your Bible aside. Don't do it. That would be like being, you know, like you're on a football team and you have a big game on Friday night, and so you're really busy preparing for the game, so you're not going to eat any meals all week long. How's that going to go? If you're not feeding yourself spiritually, then the difficulties you face in this world, in this difficult environment, will overwhelm you. Yeah. Walk closely with God. Believe he can help you. And cooperate without compromising. 
I've seen news stories, you probably have too, of religious kids and their parents that are making huge demands of school boards regarding very small things. Have you seen that? (laughs) I'm not saying you shouldn't voice your concerns. I think you should, but I'm just saying this. You probably ought to choose your battles wisely. In every area of life, choose your battles wisely. I don't see Daniel making a lot of demands. And if anyone had a right to be a rebel, it would have been Daniel and his friends. But even their very names were changed. Even their very names were taken from from them. You know? Huh. Hey, Brandon, I'm calling you Martha from now on. You got a problem with that? He says no, but that's because he's in church. (laughs) No, our name is just part of our identity. It's part of who we are. Even their names were taken away from them. It says in Daniel 1.7, the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Do you know what those names mean? Daniel's new name was, I am a prince of Babylon's God. (laughs) I'd rather be called Martha. Hmm. Shadrach's new name was the sun god. The last syllable in the name of Meshach leads us to believe it had an erotic connotation to it. And uh, Abednego, (laughs) closest we got to that, Lucifer. Wow. Wow. How would you like to be called that? But there's no evidence that these men ever rebelled. I mean, they had some pretty stinking good names. Daniel was God is my judge. God is gracious. Who is like God? God has helped. Those are four really good names. And they they didn't get called that anymore, but they never rebelled against it. They cooperated, but they didn't compromise. They didn't compromise on the big issues, like they didn't eat the food that they felt would defile them. And Daniel didn't stop praying. He continued to pray. And They didn't bow down on the plain of Dura. They stood there while everyone else is bowed down around their ankles. They never compromised. But they were not unnecessarily uncooperative. Listen, as believers in an increasingly irreligious society, you and I have to choose our battles wisely. (laughs) And if you're known as a troublemaker, if you're known as that guy that's fighting about petty little things, your ability to influence others for Christ gets very, very tiny. Very, very tiny. (coughs) Cooperate without compromising. You gotta have a mindset to underlie all of this. It's kind of essential for students and for everyone to have a healthy mindset. And you see this in the story of Daniel and his friends. The first part of your mindset is just believe that God is in control because he is. There are always difficult circumstances that make you wonder if this is the case. Like, when the doctor comes in and says, uh, we need to sit down and talk. Whoa, is God in control? Yes, he is. Or when you get placed in, in the class with that teacher. <laughs> Not that teacher, I wanted the other teacher. Is God in control? Yes, he is. Yeah. Or when you're kidnapped and taken 900 miles across the desert to Babylon. Is God in control? Yes, he is. In, in chapter 1, verse 9... <laughs> when they've already been kidnapped and they've already been captured, verse 9 says, Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Wow. God just reached into his heart and said, I want you to treat that guy good. Give him favor. Give him compassion. He made it happen because God is in control. At work, at school, at college, always. That mindset is essential. Uh, Second in your mindset, resolve that you will stand firm. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Hmm. Stand firm, no matter what's going on around you. You know, a good Jewish boy dropped into Babylon in the days of Daniel would be kind of like taking a good Kermansville boy and dropping him into the middle of Las Vegas in the most sinful section of the city. With all the intoxication and all the promiscuity and all the hedonism, I'm thinking Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, their heads must have been swimming when they hit the ground. But they had a commitment to stand firm, no matter what was around them. 
Remember in verse 8 of chapter 1, Daniel resolved not to do this. Not to do this. And when you go to school, or you go to college, or when you go to work tomorrow, you will be offered to engage in things, to take things that you ought not take. All your life, doors will open that if you walk through them, you will defile yourself. And you'll see those same doors on every corner. So make a firm commitment to God. Commit between you and him. Make a covenant between you and him that you will stay away from destructive things, from addictive things. Commit to finding friends who will pull you up toward God and not pull you down away from him. Commit to standing clear of anything damaging, even relationships. Standing firm is an essential to success in every area of life. So the mindsets, number one, believe that God's in control. Number two, resolve that you will stand firm. And number three, trust that he's with you. Remember how Daniel and his friends chose to abstain from the king's food and drink. Daniel placed a wager there. (laughs) He does. He he says in, in verse 11 of chapter one, the scripture says, Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. So he's out on a limb. He's out on a limb. But look what happens. Three verses later in verse 15, at the end of those 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who ate the royal food because God was with them. Trust God to take care of you if you live out your commitment. You know, as you prepare for the school year, let me just ask you some questions. And if you're not in school, as you prepare for going to work or whatever is in front of you, think about these questions. Do you want to just be the same as everybody else who's just letting life happen to them, who's just a consumer sucking it in, and allowing themselves to be tossed around. I really dare you not to do that. I dare you to be a Daniel. Be like Daniel and his friends. Don't go with the flow. Do you want to just go with the flow, or do you want to stand up for something of meaning? And I'm going to tell you, we find so many stupid causes in this world. You know? Man, the cause of Christ, I want to stand up for that one, for him, for Christ crucified. Do you want to do that? Do you want to live well? Do you want to be someone through whom God can make a difference for eternity? Man, I do. This past week when I, was it this week or the week before? Week before, when I went down and talked When I went down and talked to uh, Margaret's brother, presented the gospel to him. (laughs) You know, he had, he, he, they took life support away from him. He was expected to die. And, and, (laughs) and, and when I talked to him, I said, you were going to die. He said, yeah, I was going to die. Have you made your peace with God? Well, I have now. (laughs) And then I got to share, well, let me tell you exactly how to do that. I'm going to tell you, that's the tallest I've stood in months to be able to do that. Don't you want that in your life? Don't you want to be used by God for a big way or a small way? If you want that, if you want that, then I want to pray that you would have the resolve of Daniel and his friends. And the things that we've spoken about in this, uh, in this message would begin to characterize you in a fuller and greater way. So if you're comfortable doing so, let's stand together. And let's unite our hearts in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful for Daniel and his example to us. And we are thankful that we don't have to look and think, well, yeah, that's a guy that lived thousands of years ago. And, you know, we can't expect anything like he 
experienced, and most of us wouldn't want a lot of what he experienced, but here's what we can expect. Here's what we do expect. That the living God of Daniel would be our God as well, and he would enable us to be who you have for us to be. So I pray that we would be men and women who believe that you are in control, and that we would resolve that we will stand firm, and that we would trust that you would be with us. We trust you to use us, Father, and to accomplish in us and through us all that you desire. In Christ's name, amen. You know, I feel like we haven't done this song in a while, and I love this one. With what we talked about this morning before service, this song is a prayer. The chorus says, Father, will you come and open up our eyes? Fill us with your heart and renew us with your life. Consume us with your majesty. God cares deeply about the relationship that he has with us. God is all about relationship with us. He sent his son Jesus to die for us. And this song isn't asking God to show up because he's always with us. He's always present in our lives. God promises that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That when two or more are gathered together, he's right there in the midst. But this is a prayer asking us, asking God for us to be aware of it. For God to open up our hearts, to open up our eyes. Because truth be told, going through this day to day life, we can get hard hearts. We can close our eyes. But God's still there always. And if that's your prayer this morning, if that's your heart, let's just sing this song. Asking God to open our eyes and open our hearts. Let us be aware of the Father's presence because He's here. Thank you, Lord, that you're here. There's a love for getting my failures. There's a home that's setting me free. There's a Consume us.
stand as your benediction. God bless you as you go from here today. Mm -hmm.